was afraid for a moment Mr. Murray was going to ask you all to go. After all, I've been looking forward to coming to this city for several years. Dr. Fuller invited me several years ago and wasn't able to come. So finally we were able to come. It'd be a shame if we had to terminate the meeting now. Although I think you've had a sermon enough and message enough for the evening. To me, it's a delight to look out on your hills here. I love the hilly country. We come from a part of the country that is a bit hilly and, of course, up a little farther, a great many mountains. And we spend a lot of time there. And it's lovely to be down in this area and to see the beauty of this countryside. And I assure you that it's been a pleasure to me to see it. Now, I want to preach to you tonight on a subject that was suggested to me by students. We have a great many students that come to our church, and these students make suggestions. They're not at all adverse to making them either positively or negatively as they feel like it. And this particular subject was suggested to me by some students in the University of Southern California asking that I speak to them on the subject, Is Jesus Christ Relevant to the Age? I did that in that particular occasion, and then I forgot all about it. Until just recently, I wanted to prepare a sermon in my own church on the subject, Is Jesus Christ Relevant to the Societal Problems of Today? And my mind went back to this passage of Scripture, which I'm going to read for you. It's in Matthew 22, 34 to 40, and in Romans 13, 8 to 10. But when the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now turn, if you will, to Romans 13, 8 to 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this... Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not cover. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, Jesus said, on this commandment hang all the law and the prophets. Perhaps you're disturbed. I am. Maybe you're a bit disturbed about the events which have been happening in our own nation. Events which demonstrate to us that this great nation needs an infusion of moral fiber, of character, and of that which will build righteousness in the hearts and lives of men and women. So much so that it is a burden in my own heart, a burden that can be best expressed by saying that the most desperate need of the hour is that we shall get a new concept of justice, of judgment, of law, of holiness, and of retribution. Think for a moment of what's just happened in the Brooklyn school system, where 544 students have been suspended, hundreds of others from other schools, and where the situation only reflects what has taken place in city after city of America but probably not so publicly. Here we have seen reported rape, knifings, 
threatenings of violence, even under killing, the browbeating of teachers until they locked themselves in rooms to protect themselves from students, and finally, the suicide of a principal because he could no longer face this revolt of the teenage students in his school. Oh, someone says, that's Brooklyn. That's New York. That's the cesspool of iniquity. We can make excuses for that. Is that so? What would you make as an excuse for that student in Lansing, Michigan, who took his teacher and her companion out and raped them both and then stood them up against the automobile car and beat them with his fists because they had threatened to flunk him in his exam. I was speaking to the Reformed men or the men of the Reformed Church of America in Chicago in their annual meeting just a few weeks ago. When I finished speaking, several men came to me from one of the little towns in Michigan and they related to me the events that were going on in their schools and the helplessness they had with which to face them. Now, don't think for a moment that the things that are going on in Brooklyn are not going on in sections of Boston and Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Washington and other cities of this nation today. They are going on in this direction. It was my responsibility a few weeks ago to preach on the subject delinquency, crime, and capital punishment. And I spent days in the libraries reading the articles upon this subject and seeing the statistics that were brought out by the FBI, by educators and others, rolling up a mighty wave of crime among the teenagers of this nation. So that the majority of the crimes, the greatest number in the roll or the curve of crimes, is perpetrated and committed by those who are 19 or 18 years of age in this nation. You say in one place, better be disturbed. And then we look into the papers and see the reports of the criminality in the form of violence, of intimidation, of beatings, of the use of goon squads and thugs and gunmen and trigger-happy individuals in the labor movement of this nation. And we ask ourselves, what is taking place in organized labor that this can take place and this can occur? And then we read about the depression or the little recession we're in and the revising of the interest rate by the Federal Reserve and the increase of unemployment and the decrease in the interest of money and the results in the stock market and then see the reflected terror and fear in the lives of men and women worried because their material substance seems in the possibility of failing away. And then you read about Sputnik and you see the results and the reaction of the American public. Bertrand Russell expressed it aptly in the American Review of Literature. And what did he say? He said there are two reactions to the Russian advance in science. One is congratulations and admiration on their achievement. The other is stark terror to know that such advance is in the hands of the communists. This result has been seen throughout the world today. And simultaneous with that, we're hearing on the part of many of our religious leaders words that propagate the idea of brotherly love, of social welfare, of justice, which instead of being a presentation of biblical truth, the terminology of which may be taken from the Bible, is a perversion of divine law and of the gospel itself. If the Ten Commandments are valid in your life, if they're applicable to an individual moral standard, they must also be applicable to a social standard. And it is utterly fatal for a society to hold a dual standard of morals in which one standard is applied to individuals and another standard is applied to social questions and social situations. And yet that's what we're seeing 
in our day. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not lie. These are the commandments of God that are based upon his own moral nature, that are woven into the warp and woof of the universe, that are written into constitutional law, and that must be applied unto society and must not be broken by society. Now, it's a tragic thing in my way of thinking that we ministers who spend so much time in the university and in theological seminary and even in graduate work, practically never get a course in the largest area of ethics in which we could possibly study, namely economics. We pass through college, we go on through theological seminary, and sometimes we take advanced works on doctorates and never get a course in this. And yet, it is in the field of social ethics in the field of economics that the great battle is being waged today between individualism and collectivism, between the application of the commandments of God in an individual way and in a social way. And it's time that we gave some thought to these matters. For we've been tolerating crime, aberrations, miscreancy. We've been looking with wishful thinking upon Soviet action and Soviet pronouncements, and we have been perpetrating deeds that will certainly destroy not only the foundations of our society, but ultimately the forms of society if we continue as we are. Therefore, it is my simple thesis tonight that we must preach Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ is the answer to your personal problem, to your family problem, and also to the community and social problems, but that Jesus Christ must not be preached as some sentimental example, some exemplary character, some pattern of conduct merely, someone who is only to inspire us, but that Jesus Christ must be preached in the context of divine revelation, in the backdrop and the framework of the law of God, and that Jesus Christ must be understood as the one who revealed a God who's holy and just and righteous, as well as a God of love and mercy and kindness. And if we do not see Jesus Christ in that way, Jesus Christ is no answer at all. Now let's be a little more specific. Look for a moment at the law. There came certain people unto Jesus Christ and asked him questions. There was the rich young ruler. He came to the Lord and bowing before him, said to him, Good master, what good thing must we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Keep the commandments. He said, What commandments? The Lord said, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Honor thy father and thy mother. The young man said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Later, the Pharisees came, or rather a lawyer, representing them, came to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, Master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What saith the law? And the man said, The law saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, This do, and thou shalt live. Note now the answer that Jesus gave him. This do, and thou shalt live. Then the Pharisees themselves came that last week of his life, trying to entangle him in speech that they might accuse him. And they said to him, Master, which is the greatest of all the commandments? And he, quoting Moses, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Will you note that in every case Jesus pointed them to the law? For the law is holy and just and good. For the law is a way of life. For the law is the revelation of the righteousness of God. The law has three purposes as I'll tell you in a moment, if time permits. But this law was the object of Jesus pointing 
and now it was the one standard that he held before each one of these cases. And what is the law? Well, it consists of two tables in the Decalogue. The first of the four commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now these four commandments comprise the first table of the Decalogue and their vertical relationships to God. A man's obligation to the Father, to his God. Then the second table of the Decalogue had a horizontal relationship to our fellow men in which he said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and so on, till thou shalt not covet. And these deal with this horizontal relationship. This is the law. Now, this law of God has been the standard of moral rectitude in society from the beginning. Some people say, well, didn't, wasn't the law given by Moses? And what did they do without the law before the time of Moses? Well, any student that's here knows that the Code of Hammurabi was written over 500 years before the law of Moses, and it's almost like under the law of Moses. Where did Hammurabi get that code? Well, if you'll read Romans 2.14, you'll find the answer to that, that those who are heathen are, who are the Gentiles who have not the law of God and do by nature the things contained in the law show the law of God written on their hearts. Their conscience is either accusing or excusing them. Now, I'm quite conversant with all the theories of, of uh, Hume and Locke and of, of Kant and others concerning the nature of the human mind as it comes into the world, that it's a tabula rasa and that we bring absolutely nothing. But the Bible is against that whole view of philosophy. The Bible says that when we come into this world, we come with the law of God written upon our consciences, written upon our hearts, so that if a man violates the law of God, that that individual man is condemned by his own conscience, and before the judgment bar of God, he will be left without excuse. And you study anthropology, and you will find in the ethnic histories of the relations of the world that everywhere that you go, there were commandments like unto the Ten Commandments that were woven into the experience of humanity. Now there came the day when God in pure form gave them unto Moses to reveal sin and to show up the transgression. But let's never forget that the law is based upon the nature of God. It reveals the righteous attributes of God and that it's true whether a man obeys it or not and that God has woven it into the warp and woof of the universe so that the nation or the individual that forgets God and breaks his commandments will be brought down to hell. Well, that's only one purpose of the law. The second purpose is what I've just mentioned when Moses received it namely to be a tutor to Jesus Christ, to reveal the transgression, to show sin, to convict us of our wrongdoing, and to show that we need Jesus Christ. In fact, the very interpretation of the law by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount reveals unto us that there's no man who's ever kept the law perfectly, and therefore that he needs a substitute, he needs a savior. But the second purpose of the law is as the tutor to bring us to Christ. But now what is the third purpose of the law? If you will read the Heidelberg Confession of Faith and Catechism or the Westminster Catechism, this is the strange thing that you'll find. You will find that the gospel comes first, the question of sin, of adoption, of uh, justification, of effectual calling. And these things are answered first, and then comes the treatment of the law. Approximately the 38th question, running for about 40 questions in the catechism. Why does the law follow the gospel if the law is the tutor to bring us to Christ? Because of the great third purpose of the law. And that is that it is a standard of righteousness, that it reveals the moral rectitude in the life of the individual believer and also in society. And what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in likeness of sinful flesh condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk night after the flesh but after the spirit. Now mark you this. The law then commanded 
perfection and demanded righteousness and moral rectitude in the sight of God. And Jesus Christ came into the world born under the law to fulfill the law, to bring to pass the abrogation of the law as a means of righteousness and justification in the sight of God. Now those who are theologians would talk about the negative and or the passive and the active obedience of Jesus Christ. What do they mean by that? Well, I mean that when a man gives an active obedience to the law, he's trying to fulfill it in every jot and tittle. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And when he died, he said, I have finished the work that thou gavest me. And he could point his fingers at the Pharisees and say, Which one of you convinceth me of sin? He lived utterly and impeccably pure before the law. He fulfilled every bit of the law. For the law, he said, could not be, could not pass away till all be fulfilled. Moreover, he said, the Son of Man came not to destroy, but to fulfill the law. This was his active obedience unto the law. And then on Calvary, Jesus Christ took into his body the penalty of judgment of sin, the curse of the broken law, and death, which was spiritual death decreed by the law. In Colossians 2, 14 and 15, we read that remarkable passage that on the cross, the Lord Jesus took the commandments which were contrary to us and the ordinances which were at enmity to us and they were nailed to the tree. And that in the cross, they were invalidated. In the cross, they were satisfied and declared null and void. What does it mean? Well, in Days of antiquity, I'm told, and there's some discussion of, among scholars about the validity of this, but I think this is the kind of thing to which it refers. They said that when a man had a debt and that debt was played, if it were a mortgage on his house, that they'd take the mortgage and they'd nail it to the door of his house. Well, maybe it's true and maybe it's false, but anyway, what happened to Jesus Christ was this, that on the top of his cross, they said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now, that could be very well representative, according to St. Paul, of the Ten Commandments that were nailed to that cross, and in them it could be said that they were invalidated, that they were fulfilled, that they were satisfied, that no longer did they hold any control over those represented by Jesus Christ. Beloved, it's when you as an individual will recognize that you're a sinner, that you're condemned and lost and under the judgment of the law and the curse of God and eternal damnation and death, and then you will take Jesus Christ as your righteousness and receive him as your representative and your substitute. Then it is that a holy God overlooks and covers the sins that are past and declares a sinful man to be holy in his sight and remains a righteous God when he does it because Jesus Christ satisfied the law upon Calvary in that death. But is that the end of it all? Not for a moment. Not for a moment. Because human society can only be blessed and prospered and be a divinely ordered society when that society is built upon the ground of God's revealed law. And if society breaks that law, if society transgresses that law, it will be fatal. If it obeys that law, it will be prospered. Where does Christianity come in then? Well, there's no disharmony here. The harmony is this, that whereas the law has been abrogated as a means of salvation, whereas it's been filled and satisfied in the sight of God, and a man is positionally declared holy and righteous by faith, which is the great doctrine of justification by faith, the moving doctrine of the Protestant Reformation, when that has happened, then Jesus Christ imputes and imparts his Holy Spirit unto the individual, enabling him to do by the Spirit what he could never do in his own strength, namely to walk according to the law. And the Christian then vindicates and sanctions and supports and upholds the whole of social righteousness because of the righteousness of God that's wrought within his own life. Therefore, the Christian becomes helpful instead of 
hindering to the social righteousness of society. And Jesus Christ becomes powerfully relevant there. I read after preaching on capital punishment some weeks ago an article in one of our religious magazines that declared that Jesus Christ satisfied all the law of God, which is perfectly true. But that because he satisfied the law of God on behalf of those whom he represented, therefore we should never exact capital punishment any longer from a criminal who commits murder, but that we should try only remedial instead of retributive punishment. And this seems to be the soft general thinking of people in the government and even in the church today. Beloved, Jesus Christ did not abrogate the law for society. Jesus Christ abrogated and satisfied it only as a means of justification of believing men that they might be righteous in the sight of God. And the law still stands that if a man sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. And let's not by any soft means of thinking move this away. When in our day they coddle these miscreants and these delinquents and these criminals in labor and in all phases of society, we are simply laying the foundation for the breakdown of society. The hour has come when they need to round up those delinquents and put them in a work camp under government auspices and put them to work if they can't live in the high schools or in the colleges and live like decent citizens of the day. I tell you, it's soft thinking to think anything else. And if you think you're going to have revival by preaching some sentimental Jesus who's merely an example of love and righteousness, and we never handle these problems on an ethical, strong, justice, and right and proper basis according to the Bible, we'll go the way of Rome and we'll go the way of Assyria and of Egypt and of the nations of antiquity, as Toynbee warns us we're going in these days. Now, the Lord Jesus sanctioned the law. Wherever he found someone who professed the law and broke it, what did he do? Well, he condemned them with a terrible indictment. He said to the people of his day, in a few verses after what I read to you, these Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They have the authority. What they say unto you, do. But do not do what they do. And then he went on, to castigate them with, I think, some of the worst words that you'll find in all of the Bible. He called them blind guides, fools, hypocrites seven times in the one passage, whited sepulchers, generation of vipers, children of hell. And he told them that there, they had, that there was no use for them in his thinking and that they were setting a bad example to the people and that they were utterly no good. And yet they were the religious crowd of the day. They believed in the supernatural. They believed in angels. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in the answer to prayer. They believed in God. They believed in all these things, but what did they do? They were wickedly hypocritical in praying and devouring widows' houses, dishonesty, in tithing minanus, anus, and cousin, and omitting the weightier things of judgment, mercy, and law. They were painting the sepulchers of the prophets and then killing the prophets of their day. These men were hypocrites, and Jesus condemned them to hell. What about the departure from law in our day? Need I take time? I can't, because the clock's running out. I tell you how we're breaking the Sixth Commandment in society and sanctioning it with coercion and violence, all of which suggest and often eventuate in breaking of that commandment, in the closed shop, in certain forms of strike, in intimidation, in beating, in the use of all these methods we've mentioned. Need I say anything about the way the teenagers are doing the same thing? You had reference of it in your papers today about those Connecticut youths. There are only a few of the many who are doing the same thing. Need I speak about the Seventh Commandment and give you the evidence from Sorokin's book called The American Sex Revolution, which I reviewed for Christianity Today and which uh, I think is one of the most revealing books of our day. 
Don't forget Sorokin is the greatest sociologist in America, if not in the world today, from Harvard. He's written more than 30 books, and his books are authoritative as textbooks in the universities of this country. And on the ground of his many, many years of research, he wrote this book, The American Sex Revolution. And then he draws the analogy between the histories of civilizations of the past on the ground of his previous books and shows you how that America is going the same way that those civilizations are going, and that if we continue in the same Acti actions of indulgence of sex in this nation that we will be buried in oblivion. Here's a man calling for monogamy. Here's a man calling for restraint of petting and, and all these things among you. Here's a man, a sociologist, telling you from the evidence of history that we're going down to oblivion because we're breaking the seventh commandment. Need I say anything about the Eighth Commandment with dishonesty? Need I say anything about the Tenth Commandment with covetousness? And people who, with our covetousness, want to violate the Fifth Commandment and want to be indolent, want to have a paternalistic government, want to have other people support them? Need I say anything about government that steals from one group to give to another, that robs you of your insurance policy, 50, 60, 75 percent of what you put in it over the last 25 years, or your pension, or whatever it is, to give to another group of people? These things are breaking the commandments of God, and this nation will go down! because the law of God cannot be broken with impunity. Now the Lord Jesus Christ interpreted the law. He said love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul picked it up and he took the same thing and quoted the commandments and said, if there be anything else, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now when you talk about brotherly love, you don't love that teenage miscreant if you don't apply the law. You don't love that criminal. You don't love society. You don't love your daughter, your son, your family, unless you apply the law of God. Jesus applied it. It's time for us individually to take absolute love and absolute truth and absolute honesty and absolute purity and begin to judge our actions according to the law of God and not be hypocritical in the kind of professing religious Christian lives that we have. A few weeks ago, I spent the night with Mr. H.J. Taylor, the chairman of Club Aluminum Company. We've been friends for about 20 years. And we were at Urbana, Illinois, at the great convention of InterVarsity, where there were 3,500 students. And that night we talked into the night. And some years ago, Herb began memorizing scripture. When his club aluminum company was almost broke, he decided that he'd memorize the Sermon on the Mount. And he quotes it to himself every day. And he said, you know, Harold, one day I was sitting down there and I was trying to summarize the things of the Sermon on the Mount. And he said about the teachings of Jesus. And he said, I wrote down four things about my business. The test, everything that came up, is it right? Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Is it beneficial to all who are involved? And he said, I made that the four-way test after praying about it and applied it to my business. The business began to prosper. If you know anything about it, if you're in the Rotary Club, he became the international president, and this is adopted by the Rotary Club. It's gone all over the world. Well, down in Florida, where Mr. Cato is, in a town not far from him, last year or two years ago, I believe it was, they decided they'd adopt this model. So they brought in the preachers and the uh, policemen and the educators and teachers and everybody, and they, they had them learn this, and they had them apply it, and they printed it, and they had it before the people all through the year. Then a year later, they had a great banquet. Mr. Taylor went down there, and he told me about it. And he said, you know, it was wonderful. He said the divorce rate had dropped, the juvenile delinquency rate had dropped. He said the vandalism had dropped, stealing had dropped. He said everything that was bad had dropped and everything that was good had gone up in a remarkable way. What was it? Why, it was our return to the standards of divine law. That's all. Now time is gone. We have two minutes before the benediction, and so I can only say this. When Jesus Christ means to you righteousness in your personal life, 
Not that you're going to try to win your salvation by obeying the commandments or doing something right and thus be saved before God and take your chances. But when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and as the only mediator between God and man, that then Jesus Christ becomes the means, the power, the dynamic, the infusion, the moral impetus that will enable you to live according to the law. When in your family you adopt these standards of righteousness, and when in the community life you will not permit these things to be transgressed, and when in government you will not vote for those men that will propagate and advance items and programs that will violate them, and you will not stand for your representatives in international affairs to violate them, then when we stand not on expediency and not on exigency, but upon the foundation of the word of God in moral truth and righteousness, you can expect God to bless your life and your family and your community and your nation, and not before. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank thee tonight that thou hast not left us without a witness and without a firm understanding of righteousness. Grant, we pray, that every one of us who professes to be Christian or who is interested in being a Christian may know the gospel and know that the gospel and the law are not divorced, but that one builds upon the other and fulfills it. So make Christ real to us, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.